Sir, do me a favor, take your hands out of your pockets for me. Take your hands out of your pockets. Hey, at the ER. Okay, let's go patch down for weapons, okay? You got anything that's gonna poke, stick yeah. up and hurt me? Uh uh. Okay, just relax for me. Just relax. Relax. Why are you shaking for? Relax. Been shot. He's got a gun. What is good, my people? We are live back again with another episode of The Forecast. Now, one thing about our community is how easily it could be divided. It's always been easier for us to point the finger and blame each other for the situation that we're in. Blame our ancestors, blame whoever. Everybody but the people who are in the position to dominate us in the first place. Now, recently, Denzel Washington, who I have respect for as an actor still, and I still support all of his movies, but recently, Denzel Washington made some comments that a lot of people took off and ran with when he was asked about black people in the justice system and is there racism. So let's go back and hear exactly what he had to say about it. It was something I read where you talked about your people from Mount Vernon saying that, you know, like they've done like 40 years in a penitentiary together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and, you know, incarceration rates in America has been a problem, especially as opposed to minorities. And Roman delves into this, the, the issues around the, the legal system. Do you think we've made any headway? In the I legal think it's system? more important to make headway in our own house. By the time the system comes into play, the damage is done. They're not locking up seven-year-olds. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I was in Chicago a couple of three, four weeks ago, and we saw these little kids on bikes with masks on the side of their head, like five or six of them. And the driver said, yeah, they're little yummies. I said, who? He said, little, little yummies. Look up. Google little yummy. Mm. Little yummy was an 11-year-old murderer. Wow. And you look at his picture, you'll see the headshot of him, and he's like this. And he got murdered at 11 by a 14-year-old Wow. who's doing life now and a 16-year-old. That makes no sense. You, you blame the system? Where was his father? Yeah. It starts in the house. It starts in the home. 
And yeah, well, well, my father got locked up. Well, where was his father? Yeah. You know, it, that, that, the, like I, I did talk about my three closest friends, and they did, you know, 15 to 25, one did 28, this and that. I was the only one of the three that had a father in my life, even though my parents were together. But I still had a father who was a gentle man and a good example, yeah. and they didn't. We can blame the system if we want, but they didn't lock any of us up at seven. Yeah. We were all doing enough to get locked up at 13. My parents sent me in another direction. They didn't have anybody to help them, and they kept doing what they was doing, and the system got them. So I, I don't, the, the system is rigged, but why, all the more reason not to help it. So Denzel basically goes with the whole what about black on black crime thing. And he was saying, well, the system doesn't lock up seven-year-olds. Well, by the time you're seven, you go into a public education system designed to indoctrinate you. That we know throughout history, there has been a clear racial bias towards. By seven years old, you learning that Christopher Columbus discovered America. And the only thing you tell them about their history is Martin Luther King in February and that they were slaves brought over here and they were lucky to even have that happen because they were savages before that. We know about the school to prison pipeline, but we overlook the fact that it has been illegal for us to read and write in this country longer than it has been legal for us to be able to go to public schools. Our parents and grandparents had to fight literally, have dogs sicked on them, water hoses sprayed at them, all just to be able to let their kids go to public schools. The year was 1957. The campus of Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, became a battleground in the fight for school desegregation. It was in September that nine black students, six girls and three boys, became forever known as the Little Rock Nine. On September 2nd of that year, days before Central High was to be integrated, Governor Orville Faubus of Arkansas ordered National Guardsmen to surround the school. Their orders? To only let the white students in. I acted to protect the persons and property of the people of Little Rock. Faubus was defying the Supreme Court decision which required desegregation of schools. A judge later ruled that Faubus used the troops to prevent integration, not to preserve law and order, as he had claimed. To avoid any further violence and to enforce the law, President Eisenhower sent in troops of his own. I have today issued an executive order directing the use of troops under federal authority to aid in the execution of federal law at Little Rock, Arkansas. Escorted by the 101st Airborne Division, these nine students faced jeering crowds and racial slurs as they walked through the doors of Central High. And yeah, I agree, they should have kept their own schools and did their own thing, but every time they have their own school, it somehow gets destroyed, burnt down, gets attacked. They would call you racist if you say black people need their own education system. And when they talk about black on black crime, most of the black men in jail are for nonviolent drug offenses. The same thing which is an epidemic in the white community, but they're being sent to hospitals, not to prison. They still haven't done anything for the people who are affected by crack. They still sending them to prison right now. Even though if you caught up in the opioid epidemic, they'll let you turn in your drugs, no questions asked. And when they bring up black on black crime, I assume they're getting their information from the FBI, which themselves give a disclaimer saying, you know, this is just an estimate. But what is the methodology that they use to get these statistics? Does it go by conviction? Does it go by charge? Does it go by just being arrested? Does it go by being suspected of committing a crime? Because if it goes off conviction, Sort of like Officer Betty Shelby or someone like George Zimmerman, who isn't even a cop. They killed someone, but they weren't convicted. So they're not considered murderers and they won't count towards the stats. Now, when you talk about black on black crime, of course, I agree that black people shouldn't kill other black people. 
I think that is insanity for black people to be killing other black people. And it's just easier for us to inflict harm on each other. Now, the difference with this what about black on black crime argument when it pertains to the law is that other black people who kill black people, they go to jail. I would prefer that they get my tax money as opposed to the police officer. I know a lot of their crimes come behind economics because they have been economically starved for a long time. And then, of course, he brings up, which a lot of people bring up, was where was the father? Now, today, black men and black women fight over who fault it is that our community is destroyed. And I'm not going to sit here and say that black men are perfect, black women are perfect, and we haven't made mistakes. These last couple hundred years have really exposed some true character flaws in us as a people that we're going to have to work on. But at the same time, we can't sit up here and blame each other for a situation that neither one of us have the power to create. Now, maybe in history, black men could have tried to fight harder or died trying to get us out of the situation and protect the woman. And there are things that women could have done. But we've never really done anything about where this mentality comes from in the first place. We have bought into the hype that they tell us about each other. Now, again, when you say that a child needs a father... I agree with that. I don't know anybody who doesn't agree with that. But we never really address how we even got to this point. We say, oh, well, it's black women's fault. And they say, oh, well, it's black men's fault. But at the end of the day, neither black men or women had any part in creating a system that was designed throughout the entire history of America to break up the black family. Because you can't talk about the mindset of the people in the projects without talking about how they ended up in the projects in the first place. It wasn't black men or women that came into their own cities to burn it down and destroy all of their wealth when they built it after slavery during the 1920s and 30s and 40s. Black men and women had to work together during the 50s and 60s just to fight for the civil rights of us today. But it wasn't black men and women idea to build highways right through the middle of their neighborhoods and build what we know today as projects to replace them. So after years of having their businesses and their homes destroyed, our ancestors were out here fighting and marching just to get jobs to feed themselves. So in 1968, the government says, you know what, we'll give you welfare. And said, well, we'll give you shelter, food, and we'll let you go to the doctor and everything like that. Except you cannot have a man in the house. Now, today it's easy to say, well, black men abandoned us. Or for black men to say, well, black women kicked us out the house and chose up on us. It's easy to say that now, but back then, they didn't have opportunities. They were living in a Jim Crow South. They were getting beat up by the police every day. They were getting arrested for everything they did. And then today we question why we have the single mother problem that we have in our community. But let me say this, just because you qualify as a single mother does not mean the kid does not know or have his father. It just means you're not married to the father. You could be a couple living together, loving each other, have the most healthy home. You're just not married because... Maybe because you're against religion or because you don't agree with the state laws behind marriage, especially divorce. It does not mean that you are not in your kid's life. But there are far too many kids who don't have their father. Now, of course, we could all be more responsible. You know, black men protect your sperm and realize the value of it and what could happen if it ends up in the wrong place. Now, I don't put this on one group or the other because I personally think black women are important and are necessary and they are equal to us. They are no better. They are no worse. And we need black men and black women to change things together. But we don't listen to each other's complaints. We don't hear each other out. And the easiest thing we could do is fight with each other as opposed to address the real issues and actually achieve the solutions that we need to achieve. And finally, let's stand up for what's always been best about the Rainbow Coalition, which is 
people coming together across racial lines. You talked about Mr. Fields from Louisiana that you had here last night, a great role model. We don't have a lot of time to do this. We don't have a lot of time. You had a, a rap singer here last night named Sister Soldier. I defend her right to express herself through music, but her comments before and after Los Angeles were filled with a kind of hatred that you do not honor today and tonight. Just listen to this, what she said. She told the Washington Post about a month ago, and I quote, if black people kill black people every day, why not have a week and kill white people? So you're a gang member and you'd normally kill somebody? Why not kill a white person? Last year she said, you can't call me or any black person anywhere in the world a racist. We don't have the power to do to white people what white people have done to us. And even if we did, we don't have that low-down, dirty nature. If there are any good white people, I haven't met them. Where are they? Right here in this room. That's where they are. I know she is a young person, but she has a big influence on a lot of people. And when people say that, if you took the words white and black and you reversed them, you might think David Duke was giving that speech. Let me tell you, we all make mistakes, and sometimes we're not as sensitive as we ought to be. And we have an obligation, all of us, to call attention to prejudice wherever we see it. A few months ago, I made a mistake. I joined a friend of mine, and I played golf at a country club that didn't have any African-American members. And I was criticized for doing it. You know what? I was rightly criticized for doing it. I made a mistake, and I said I would never do that again. And I think all of us have got to be sensitive to that. We can't get anywhere in this country pointing the finger at one another across racial lines. If we do that, we're dead, and they will beat us. Even in Reverend Jackson's new math of this election, it's hard to get to a 34% solution or a 40% solution if the American people can be divided by race. All right, man, we're here live in the alley on Crenshaw in the Murr Park, right behind, uh, or right here by Delicious in that alley behind, Doc building over there, you know, the building with the sign. They're searching the car. I've been out here for about 20 minutes asking for the reasonable suspicion for the detention. They have these young men being detained, all of them. They haven't told me the reasonable suspicion or the probable cause for the search. They disallowed me from investigating the case. I haven't been able to do my investigation. And they said I couldn't do my investigation under threat of being arrested for Penal Code Section 148A1. But they're all over here. They're, they're all over here. They, they won't give me the, the reasonable suspicion for the detention. And they keep, like this is going on right now. I just got off doing a radio show, and this is going on about these kind of issues. My conversation with Tingarides, I guess, didn't make it to Southwest yet. And now I'm over here, and I'm trying to get these young men to believe in the system, and the system is being violated right now. I, how, how can I say believe in this system? It works for you. Go get a degree. Then they'll follow the law. I know. Man, this is the thing. The, the way it works, if you don't sign it, then, they, then they'll arrest you. That's it. You're not a meeting with him. You say you're going to take care of him. He's not a meeting with him. Let me finish on my phone. Take the phone for that day. Do you understand that? Okay. I'm going to sign it. So I can talk to you. Man. Well, I, well, I can't talk to him. You, now you now you saying you're about to arrest him, so now I could I could talk to him now, right? What about what about your LAPD volume volume four six fifty point one zero? Which also means that you can interrupt our investigation. Okay, but you're interrupting my investigation. I have a bar card that gives me a right to investigate as soon as you start your investigation. Let us finish our investigation. What's he's in? What's he? 
Once he's in jail, then you can go and talk to him all you want. I, I need to but do my investigation right no, now. Because now you're going to interfere with my officers. No, they wasn't talking. It's, well, it's been 20 minutes. They haven't been talking to him. They won't let me talk to him. interfere with my officers. How? How? Once, once how? They're if they're not talking to him. Once them, they're done, how? they will release them to you. How's how? That? No, I, I would like I would like to know what the what the what, what can somebody give me the probable cause for the search? Can somebody explain that for me? And now how we gonna get people to respect the law if y'all won't follow the law? We're not gonna sit here and argue with it back and forth at the We write like I'm it's, it's really happened like I I tried to be the lawyer and, and represent I just happened to be coming down the street and seeing the client. Yeah, I'm assigning it. Man, and all four of them is in handcuffs, and ain't nobody told me why they was even stopped. This is crazy. This is going on like right now. Like right now, it's, it's happening. It's like, man, this is this is how we treat. And when you wonder why young black men don't feel like they're part of the system, that they're represented by the system, this is why. This is why. I can sit here. And, or maybe we're not training the officers right, because none of them seem to know that they got to let me talk to the client once they detain them. None of them know that. None of them know. And it's in their policy. I told you, volume four, 650.10, it's all, it's in their policy. It, and the Constitution, Fifth Amendment. You got a right. You got a right to remain silent. Implicit of that is, is, the, is the right to counsel. They over here asking them questions, doing all this, but they won't let me talk to the client and advise them what's going on. This is this is this is really going on right now. This is ridiculous. And I've been cool talking to him. The cop know me. I've cross examined him before, so you know I'm a legitimate attorney, and I still can't do it. This is crazy, man. Who, like, like what can we do about it? Like, I'm I don't I'm I'm paid to give answers, and I don't have no answers. I, I can't figure this out. Yeah, I need to. What's, what's going on? Discharge in or at the building causing serious impairment. Maximum penalty 20 years. Count two. He never heard anyone announce themselves. He just saw flashlights down by the window and heard a noise approaching the porch. nominations were announced today and they are a doozy. Taylor Swift, Ed Sheeran were snubbed with only four noms between them. While those nominated for Record of the Year have created some of the most profane and misogynistic music I've ever heard anywhere. And at the top of the heap, Jay-Z nominated for his The Story of O.J. We hadn't heard enough of O.J. We need a whole album devoted to it. And Kendrick Lamar for his album 
oxymoronically titled, entitled Humble. It's joining us now uh, to uh, weigh in on this, someone who knows just a little bit about uh, this genre of music is Daytuan Thomas. He's the editor-in-chief of Vibe Magazine, and he joins us now. All right, Daytuan, I need to hear from you because I'm a music fanatic, okay? Oh, I listen okay. to, I do listen to, love music, listen to everything. I'm more of a kind of Al Green, uh, you know, good. I love Ray Charles, you know, you fast. Go. You know, I, that, I, that's what kind of my that's kind of my stuff that I love. But okay. I love all music. Let's talk about obviously Jay Z. I mean, it's a well known story, but he was a kid. You know, wasn't he a cocaine crack dealer? Stabbed mm -hmm. his did he stab but stab his manager or so someone someone in the neck or something. You, you, but, you got uh, a lot of things going on yeah. there. Well, he had a lot going on there. <laughs> yeah, but he's yeah, yeah, you're right. He's an unbelievable businessman. He's worth yeah. like a half a billion dollars. Incredible, mm -hmm. incredible businessman. But let's actually look at what some of the these lyrics are and what it, what they say to young people okay. they just heard your heard your description of why this might be good for people to express themselves here's a sample mm -hmm. of jay-z's lyrics and it's cleaned up for your consumption this is from the story of oj okay this mm -hmm. is nominated mm -hmm. um light n-word mm -hmm. i can't say the word i know i'm not saying the word mm -hmm. light n-word dark n-word faux n-word real n-word rich n-word poor n-word house n-word field n-word right house n-word don't f with me i'm a field n-word with shined cutlery mm -hmm. here's a little something from kendrick lamar's record by the way it's called uh, again as i said humble um and disassay with my boo bay tastes like kool-aid for the analyst girl i can buy yo a word with the world with my paste of ooh that p word mm -hmm. uh good won't you taste sit on my taste bloods that Change. <laughs> yeah, that's all, wrong. Da, 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 da. that's all wrong. That's all wrong. Yeah, well, it's 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 just you know it's unfortunate that you know you guys picked only those particular lines and not the more uplifting and uh, supportive lyrics that they also well, day twan, they, put it out. Is what and, it is. And, and and real quick, Laura, real quick, the the Jay Z lines, those are actually speaking to what we're discussing now no matter how far Jay-Z goes no matter how much he achieves within you know uh, mainstream's eyes he's always going to be looked at as what he was saying so that's the story of OJ, OJ Just and then, so and, then and then yeah. real quick Laura real quick yeah. and then with with Kendrick's lyrics what what he's trying to get across there is is speaking to a woman or speaking to you know the audience in a way it's that, that he woman, can that he not? can I'm the sorry? P word, the P word, the H word, and other, another of these lyrics. I mean, I, I could go through all, almost every song but there's, on these but that's, albums. But that's in, that's in country lyrics. That's in rock lyrics. The, I mean, the to, P to, word? Yeah, that's the a, P a, word? You, know, you, you haven't heard them? No, not, <laughs> they're, they're, no, I mean, not I know you're only listening to Al Green and, no, no, and those guys, but CMA you have words. to understand, no. No. Lord, you have to understand that this is a creative license, and, and they're able to do well, that from, from that word to word, from bar yeah. to bar to verse yeah, to verse. Yeah. Don't, just so you understand what I'm saying, Dave, I'm not saying people don't have a right to mm -hmm. say they can they can say they can speak on the street corner and swear in front of my kids. They can they can whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, they can use the N word. They can you know this, this is white black every genre of people. We and can Trump disrespect can, can each other. can do the same thing on Let on me just finish. Let me just and, finish. Uh, this is not just hip hop. This is the country. Okay. But my my point about this is. Don't we want to really lift people up with But you have to hear the other songs. You have to be it, able to take the whole project rather than bits and the, pieces that, right. that work the for whole, your for the your whole agenda. Project, the whole project is faith, fatherhood, country, sacrifice. Uh, giving of yourself, and I know a lot of these guys do give a lot to of course, charity, Jay -Z which has is, the, is as wonderful. As part of foundation, that's wonderful. He gives back, as does Kendrick to the Compton community. Those are the things that need to be highlighted as well. If you're going to put these things together in a right. balanced effort. Well, well, I actually, I actually do because I actually listen to, I actually listen to this both albums, and I listen to them several times. And my that's my crazy because you called this, Kendrick's album "Humble," and the album my, name is "Damn." My, but, po my, you know. my point, my point, my point, uh, okay, I need everything right, I'm not perfect, but the, point, but the point I'm trying to make is lifting people up mm -hmm. in difficult circumstances, 
I don't think a single kid who's a gangbanger in Chicago listening to most of the stuff that we're quoting tonight is going to say, hey, I can just, I guess I can be just like Jay-Z if I use yes. this kind of language, treat women this way, misogynistic lyrics. How is this good for women? Their success is enough for them to do that. That's what, that, they are the shining examples of what their condition is and what they can get out of that conditioning and environment. What, money? The, no, not money? money. No, 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 not money. Influence. What Jay-Z is doing is employing, you know, dozens and yeah, dozens oh, of people, agree. sometimes hundreds, as well as, as right. kids. Do you think anyone is going to be performing any of this music 25 years from now at a They're Super doing Bowl it now. Hip-hop is over 40 years old, and they're still doing it. Jay-Z is about Super, to be 48 next week. I said Super Bowl week. halftime show. That's what I said. I don't Trust. think so. I don't yes, think indeed. So. Trust me, the Laura. The power of OJ, I don't think I'm gonna take gonna you to one of the concerts. On the concerts. Laura, go to one of the concerts with me. Go to one of the concerts okay. with me. Let's, okay, let's do it. I'll, act, I'll, I'll, do, I'll, I'll do that, and then okay. we, we, we can go down to Nashville, and we can also see some, see some great stuff together. I'm, okay? I'm totally with I'm that. And we we'll, got, we we'll got write a date. about it. We'll write about it together. <laughs> <laughs> You're fun, Dayton. You're fun. Thank I you. like it. All right, and we back on the forecast. Now, there are millions of reasons for us to put aside our tribalisms to stop the in-house beefing and focus on the real problem at hand, but yet somehow we can't seem to be able to do that. Now, you would think being able to protect our children would be a good enough reason to put aside all of our differences, all of our personal beliefs, to unify and actually do something about the problem. But we rather blame each other when neither one of us have the ability to get justice if they shoot one of our children dead in the street. Like the young brother in Connecticut, Jason Negron, he was unarmed and he was shot and killed by the police. Now let's go back and see what justified the shooting of this unarmed teenager, Jason Negron. Next tonight, here the deadly police shooting of a teenager in Connecticut, a 15-year-old boy allegedly ramming an officer with a stolen car. And now, new video showing the moments after police opened fire. Here's ABC's Lindsay Davis. These images, taken by a bystander, are raising questions tonight. 15-year-old Jason Negron handcuffed on the ground with his head facing to his right. The camera pans off, and four seconds later... Negron's head is in a different position. The victim's family says the picture suggests Negron was still alive. And they say that contradicts what police told them, that Negron was killed when he was shot. According to Bridgeport, Connecticut police, the officer shot Negron after he refused orders to stop, and he hit an officer with a stolen car on Tuesday. This is a, a young man who put himself in a really bad situation and lost his life. The 21-year-old passenger was also shot, but suffered non-life-threatening injuries. The police chief says Negron's body was lying in the street for about six hours after the shooting for evidence-gathering reasons. But Negron's family members say the police never provided him medical attention that they believe might have saved his life. Hundreds gathered last week to pay tribute to the teen and call for action. That officer is on administrative leave pending the outcome of an investigation. So they say this young brother, Jason Negron, was ramming an officer, forcing Officer James Bradley to shoot and kill him. Now, in the police report, they said Jason accelerated and reversed, striking at least one officer. And the officer was forced to fire at least one shot, hitting both Jason and the passenger that was with him. Now, I don't know how he shot both of them with one bullet, like this was that movie Wanted or something, like he Angelina Jolie out this bit. But their original story was that they shot him and the bullet hit him in the head and he died right there on the scene. Now, the problem is his cousin was there as a witness and he said that Jason never hit the police officer with a car and that they couldn't even prove that the car was stolen. And he had video that actually contradicted the whole story that the police gave. No, they just talked about the car. No, they shot him. Yeah, they shot him, right? Yeah, they shot that man. Yeah. They shot both of them? There's two of them? Oh. I only see one. one. one Damn, man. Oh, 
So after they initially said they just shot him in the head one time and he died, after his cousin puts out this video, even the police chief, Chief Armando Perez, had to acknowledge that he was mistaken about the cause of death and it was because of a shot to the torso. Following a developing story tonight in Connecticut making national news, a community reacting now after a video surfaced showing the moments right after a Bridgeport police officer shot and killed a teenage boy. Police said that 15-year-old was behind the wheel of a stolen car and hit at least one officer trying to stop him. News 8's Bob Wilson is live with a new video that may be shedding light on what happened after that boy was shot. Bob. It has been a long week. It started off this incident happened last Tuesday. There have been rallies and vigils held. And tonight, another rally after a new video comes forward and fans the flames of emotion. And we're holding the police accountable. Because that's what we do, because the police work for us. It was a sanctuary city rally in front of Bridgeport City Hall that turned into a civil justice protest. 15-year-old Jason Negron was shot and killed by police last Tuesday after he allegedly stole a car and struck two police officers. New video of Negron handcuffed laying face down on the street has surfaced on Twitter. The video shows him handcuffed on the stomach facing the camera. The camera dips down away for about four to five seconds and then pops back up and now Negron's head is facing the other direction. There is a police officer with him and sirens can be heard in the background. Police say he was pronounced dead at the scene, but in the video, family members say he looks alive, which makes them doubt the police side of the story. I think it's outrageous and it's unacceptable. Um, I don't think there's any justification for the police to have done that. Um, I, I'm sick. I'm sick seeing that video. And people we talk to say, you have to remember this is just a snapshot in time, a one-minute window. You don't know what happened before the video. You don't know what happened after the video. And that's why police say this will be part of the investigation, but they're going to look at all the evidence. Now, we did reach out to Mayor Ganim. I talked to him on the phone, and he says, really, right now, there's not much to comment on. He's waiting for the investigation by state police. I'm angry, um, and, and, and this community is angry, and we're standing together. We're not, we're not going to just sit back and let this happen. We want accountability for these officers. Bridgeport police say the officer had been on the job only one year and is on leave pending the investigation. He sold the straw. I mean, the, the last thing he wanted to do was to pull out that gun and, and, and shoot that, that, that boy. Now, two New Haven lawmakers, Porter and Winfield, say tomorrow they're planning a news conference as they advocate for more police accountability. That'll be here in New Haven. They left him out there for six hours after they shot him until he died, and they lied about it. Now, this was a 15-year-old kid, and this police officer, James Bolay, shot and killed. And all any of us can do is go beg and plead for something to be done. And the only thing that's happened to him is suspended with pay. And then after this blows over, he'll get all of that money back and get right back on the force. And this was his first year. He was a rookie officer. But these officers can make up any kind of scenario. And every piece of evidence that you find when you investigate goes against their story and contradicts what they say. But they still do not get charged. It doesn't matter if they kill your children. Like with the young brother, Darius Smith, a 15-year-old out in Cali who was shot by an undercover Border Patrol agent in self-defense, quote-unquote. Let's go back and see what happened to the 15-year-old brother, Darius Smith. A mother is speaking out tonight after her son was killed in an officer-involved shooting. The officer was off-duty and worked for U.S. Customs and Border Protection. CBS 2's Christy Fajardo is live in Arcadia with the details tonight. Christy. Yeah, also the officer says he fired in self-defense. A 15-year-old died. His 14-year-old relative is still recovering in the hospital. And tonight, the teen's family is questioning the officer's account. I'm hurt. Y'all robbed me to the core. For the last 24 hours, the mother of 15-year-old Darius Smith of Pasadena has wept but not slept. She says she's been kept up by nagging questions over the shooting death of her son by an off-duty Customs and Border Protection officer in Arcadia. When they gonna see their kids tonight. I gotta go back and tell my other three that one of them ain't coming back no more. The Sheriff's Department says the officer tells them at about 8 Friday night, he got off the gold line and so did three teens. Then, at Colorado and first, they attacked him from behind. Smith, however, 
held a gun to him while another hit him in the head, demanding valuables. That's when he says he reached for his own weapon, killing Smith and wounding a 14-year-old. Another teen ran away and was later arrested. Them boys didn't do that. They ain't done them type of boys to do that. The sheriff's department says the officer had bruising on his face, and investigators found what turned out to be a replica handgun at the scene. Smith's mother says she doesn't believe the high schooler who loved video games and dreamed of playing in the NFL would rob anyone. First they said it, it was no crime committed. Now it's a crime committed. Now it's a gun. Then they said it was a fight. I don't know what to believe. All I know is my baby gone, and I'll never know his story. Sheriff's detectives who have taken over the investigation, though, are hoping video will tell the story. They believe cameras were rolling on the gold line and at several businesses, but say because of the long holiday weekend, they have yet to be able to access it. So this undercover officer, which they don't really give his name, says this 15-year-old young brother and his friends attempted to rob him after they got off a train in the middle of the day in a busy area in L.A., and he says they put a gun to his head and start punching him in the face and all this stuff. And he was forced to reach for his gun and do something. But if they got you with a gun to your head and punching you in the face, what makes you reach for your gun? Now, they say he had bruises on his face, but he didn't really need any medical attention. But at the end of the day, it's his word versus their word. And one of them not here anymore. Now, even though this undercover officer said that these teens were robbing him and, you know, punching him in the face, they all were shot in the back. Darius Smith was shot in the back of the legs. This undercover Border Patrol agent walks up and shoots him three more times in the chest, standing over top of him, execution style. Now, of course, they found a BB gun at the scene, so this shooting is, of course, justified. And with Jason Negron, even though they're still investigating his case and this officer is on paid leave, police chief Armando Perez is still out there defending him. They can't issue a statement on the shooting, but he comes on camera and still defends this officer anyway. Now, as long as we keep pointing the finger at each other, arguing over trivial things, stuck in a tribalism mindset, and fighting amongst ourselves, we're never going to be able to get justice for our children. Whether we agree with what they accomplished during civil rights as far as integration, at the end of the day, black men and women came together to fight for the rights of themselves and their children, for the rights of us. They didn't fight over what they should call themselves, even though they had disagreements, like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X had disagreements, but they realized they were fighting for the same thing and they tried to work together and they put aside their differences to accomplish those goals, even though they had different ways to achieve it. Instead of blaming each other, we have to be working with each other on things like group economics. We can vote on a committee strictly in charge of funding and helping grow black businesses. That we all contribute to, rich, poor, whoever you are, whatever group you belong to. If you can send one dollar, send one dollar. If you can send a million, send a million. But if we can grow black businesses, we will be able to employ each other. Which will cut down on the crime rate in our own communities. The quote unquote black on black crime. We'll be able to build schools because we'll have the resources to be able to do so. We'll be able to institute our own curriculums in the schools. We can teach our kids about investing, saving, how to spend money, how to let money work for you, how to be successful people, to teach them to be doctors and lawyers and judges and the business people of the future. Our ancestors have left us the blueprint on how to do all of these things. But the problem is, at the end of the day, back then, when we had our family unit structure together, the crime rate was still high because they charged them for crimes for everything, and they still had to deal with the racist system that they were in. Even though the family unit was intact, they were dealing with lynchings more than ever. Before black men and black women had this problem with each other, we were millionaires together. 
And they came in and burnt everything down and destroyed everything. Our problem has always been being able to protect ourselves. We have to learn how to protect ourselves. Stop turning that negative energy inward and transform that energy into the motivation that you need to protect yourself. To create a future for your children to be able to thrive in. And if the future and safety of our children isn't enough to do that, then I don't know what will be. They still got the kid, the 15-year-old kid on the floor, dead, handcuffed, with no blanket covering him whatsoever. He's been there since 5 o'clock. And it's been, what, like five, six hours already? This is fucking crazy. Protesters. Five hours later, they want to pick his body up from the ground. I seen it all. I fucking seen it all, y'all. An attorney for Smith's family and people in the community say they don't believe the law enforcement narrative of what happened Friday night. Smith was with his two friends, also teenagers, in the area of First and Colorado in Arcadia, an off-duty Customs and Border Protection officer who works in San Francisco at the airport there but lives in Arcadia says three teens attacked him from behind. He told investigators he was hit in the head while another suspect tried to rob him at gunpoint. The officer says that he shot the teens to defend himself. Smith died another teen was wounded. Smith's family wants the officer who was not arrested to face criminal charges. Uh, Darius Smith was executed. Uh, he was not in the midst of uh, a robbery. Uh, he was shot twice in the legs first. He was felled and his shooter got over him and shot him three times in the chest. Uh, that's a murder. That's not s subduing a robbery. We're asking folks to 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 stand alongside the family because right now the family is mourning and Darius was a child of God he was a good kid he's an aspiring football player and we're asking that justice be served Abdullah and Merritt say that they say all too often that young black men are being portrayed as criminals when, in fact, during events like this, they're saying that that is not the case. They say that the two teenagers who were with Smith are facing robbery charges, and they believe that those charges against those teens should be dropped. Stunning video in court today showing a man shooting his teenage neighbor. Tom Murray joins us live outside the courthouse to show us what happened in the courtroom today, Tom. Mike Carroll, an incredible day for the jury in this trial of a white senior citizen accused of killing his black teenage neighbor. Today, jurors saw home surveillance video of the actual shooting. They heard from the victim's mother and they heard from the suspect in his own words. 76-year-old John Spooner on trial for murdering his teenage neighbor. Darius Simmons was a sixth grader, 13 years old. The boy's mother watched it happen. I asked him why he got that gun on my baby. There and where are you at when you ask Mr. Spooner why he has that gun on your baby? I'm in the doorway. Spooner has a home surveillance video system that captured the confrontation and shooting. Jurors saw Darius Simmons move a garbage bin from the curb. Spooner went into his house. Moments later, Spooner comes out of his house as Darius heads back toward the curb. You see Darius move backward as Spooner comes toward him with a gun. Spooner appears to point the gun toward the boy's mother, standing in her doorway. While the jury saw Spooner fire the gun, we are pausing the video just before that happened. Simmons' older brother testified about rushing to his brother. And what were you doing as your brother's in your arms? Talking to him. What are you saying? My little brother wasn't saying that, like talking to nobody. And what are you saying? I was crying. And at the same time, mad, because he's still on the corner with the gun. Then another video. Prosecutors played Spooner's recorded interrogation. The audio is difficult to hear, 
we did our best to transcribe. Did you shoot somebody with that gun? Yes, I did. Who did you shoot? I guess a 13-year-old kid. When you say you guess, that's what your mother said. Why did you shoot the gun twice today? I want either my shot or that. So the defense is expected to begin presenting its side tomorrow, and uh, they are conceding that the shooting happened, but are going to try to prove that Spooner did not mean to kill his teenage neighbor. As you may know, since January of this year, at least a dozen cases of police violence have been reported across the state of Connecticut. Four young people lost their lives as a result of police escalating nonviolent encounters, engaging in high-speed pursuits, and using lethal force against unarmed community members. That's four young lives ended by police violence in less than six months. When these incidents happen, we're always told to wait for the facts before taking action. So let's go through some facts. February 4th, New Haven activist Norm Clement, who's here, where, where are you at, Norm? Um, and Nate Blair were violently apprehended by Connecticut State Police who arrived at a protest with dogs that were so riled up that they bit several officers. Nate suffered a concussion in the incident. On March 9th, here in Waterbury, as Clinton shared, his son, Rashamel Rogers, was shot three times after being stopped on suspicion of a nonviolent offense. Thankfully, Rashamel survived. On March 29th, Austin Carr was shot in the face by Bridgeport police. Thankfully, he survived. On May 9th, as many of you know, Jason Negron and Julian Fife were stopped on suspicion of a nonviolent offense. Julian and Jason were both shot by Officer James Boulay and left handcuffed in the street and according to Julian, rendered no immediate aid by police. Ah. Julian survived, Jason died in the street right. where his body remained for six hours following the incident. A video shows Jason's body in the street handcuffed. So he was shot in the chest. They laid him down on top of his wounds, handcuffed, and let him die in the street. He was still moving in the video. So I want to talk about Connecticut General Statute 14-283, which states that police pursuits are justified only when the necessity of apprehension outweighs the danger of pursuit. We're talking about the danger to police, suspects, and bystanders. Even with this policy on the books, on January 26, 2017, Vincent Kuda Folks and his brother Sean Bowman were chased by Norwalk police and their families here today. 19-year-old um, Sean suffered a traumatic brain injury and 22-year-old Kuda died as a result of the crash. Kuda, Dion Pittman, and Joseph Edward Rothenbusher, which I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, so I apologize if I'm not. All three of these young men lost their lives in police chases in Norwalk, Waterford, and Bethel. That is just in the last six months. Uh. We know the facts. The fact is that police violence has ended the lives of far too many young people, uh. particularly black and Latinx youth in our state. Right. We have been repeatedly told that Connecticut is somehow different. And that we've all heard the and, and we've just all heard the news of yet another acquittal of an officer in St. Paul, Minnesota, who ah. ended the life of Philando Castile. Ah. Connecticut is not different. And we have to reckon with that truth. We are not different, but we can be different. We are all here today. I'm assuming because we're all committed to ending this pattern of violence. I want to hear you shout if you're committed to ending this pattern of violence. I want to hear you raise your voice. All right, we're all here because we're committed to that. And we can demand common sense reforms like policies mandating the use of body cams. We can demand all civilian review boards with the power to investigate and hold police accountable for misconduct.
Good job, buddy. Come here, grab his hand. Good boy. Good boy. Ouch. Ouch. Good job. Put your hand back. Hey, I'm coming back, man. I was going to move on drugs and I didn't know what I was doing. Can you hear me? Uh, Come on, get up. Hey, buddy. Sir. I'm on drugs. I was wanting to apologize, man. Come on. All right, and we back on the forecast. So at the end of the day, even though it is easier for us to sit here and blame each other and point the finger at each other, at some point we're going to actually have to address the issues that we have to deal with in order to solve the issues in our communities. There are things that we all could do better, and we all should strive to always do better. But at the end of the day, we are all in the same system where they can justifiably shoot and kill our children, our women, our men, whoever. We are in a system that has always systematically attacked us. They have said, pull yourselves up by your bootstraps, but if you ever suggest that, they call you racist. They make you into a terrorist, and the FBI makes you a threat. At the end of the day, we are all we got. And instead of finding a way to blame each other, we need to find a way to build with each other. So, as always, man, we have got to start standing for something. Or we're going to keep falling for anything. <laughs>